Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Angela Daniels, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I lead sustainability at Slack. Our mission at Slack for Good is to increase the number of historically underrepresented individuals in tech. We aim to realize that mission in sustainability by ensuring the meaningful involvement of those most affected by climate change in the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental programs and policies. In April, we announced our partnership with Ocean Discovery League, an organization that is dedicated to expanding accessibility of deep ocean exploration. The ocean covers 71% of the Earth's surface, but more than 90% of it remains unexplored. Mapping the ocean is difficult work, and it requires robotic vehicles that are deployed and piloted from large research vessels. Because of this, we have maps of Mars that are 100 to 1,000 times better than maps of the seafloor. Understanding the ocean is key to our sustainability efforts on this planet. In order to fully explore and understand the ocean, we must think of innovative new solutions. And here to discuss some of those solutions, we have the founder and president of Ocean Discovery League, who has participated in or led more than 40 oceanographic and archeological projects, and who created the Open Ocean Ini Initiative at the MIT Media Lab, Dr. Katie Croft Bell. Also joining us today is Denley Delaney from National Geographic Society's Exploration Technology Lab, where she manages a cutting edge portfolio of ocean exploration tools. And the Voyaging Director of Polynesian Voyaging Society, who was the first woman to lead navigate and lead captain a Polynesian voyaging canoe in a long distance deep ocean voyage from Hawaii to San Francisco, and who was recently named a National Geographic Explorer, Captain Lehua Kamalu. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Katie, I'm gonna start with you. What is Ocean Discovery League? Thank you, Angela, so much for having us today. Um, so the Ocean Discovery League is a new nonprofit organization that I just founded to break down the barriers to the deep sea by combining low cost technologies, AI driven data analysis and capacity building to make access to the deep more efficient and accessible to all, especially communities historically excluded from the field. As you just noted, the ocean covers the vast majority of our planet, but we've explored and understand very little of it. But surely we know all the fish, you say, and we know what we're doing in the ocean and how human activities impact our planet by now. Well, no, we don't, and I'll tell you why. Our limited understanding stems from the fact that it's really hard to work in the ocean, and today's approach to exploration is inefficient, expensive, and elite. Our technologies are too slow. It would take a thousand to 10,000 years to see the entire seafloor with the current tools that we have. The robotic vehicles that do exist cost millions of dollars and require large ships at tens of thousands of dollars a day to operate. And because of their expense, the few technologies that do exist are owned and operated by wealthy nations and individuals. So I founded ODL to close that gap because we need more people all over the world exploring and contributing to better understanding of the largest ecosystem on our planet before it's too late. Wow, that sounds like a really large problem um, with really complex, complex issues. It definitely um, is. <laughs> and, and you kind of explained um, how you want to broaden the participation in, in ocean discovery, but why is it important to do that? So my background is in deep sea exploration and I've been doing it for more than 20 years. I run expeditions in dozens of countries, working on big ships with some amazing vehicles. We've found ancient shipwrecks and underwater volcanoes and new deep sea creatures and it's just really cool. Uh, but one thing that's always bothered me was that we were mostly a group of Americans going to do a project in another country's waters. Sometimes we'd work closely with local scientists and sometimes we would just take one on board because we had to, to get a permit. And oftentimes, especially in those cases, we just didn't really go out of our way to co truly collaborate with them and others in their country. And this is, this is just how oceanography, especially deep sea science is typically done all over the world. The affluent countries have the tools and we do the work and we write the papers. That's the status quo. But 
at this point in time, the field really needs to evolve. We're at a point where some amazing opportunities exist, like commoditization of technologies to dramatically lower the cost of deep sea systems and sensors, or machine learning to do a much better and faster job of analyzing the data. And some of these new approaches will allow us to make the deep sea more accessible to people all over the world. And I think that it's not only the right moral thing to do, it's also necessary. We're really slow at exploring the ocean and the field is really small. So why wouldn't we try to bring in as many people and perspective as possible to accelerate our progress and create a truly global community of exploration? So I named my new organization, the Ocean Discovery League for that very reason, because it evokes this sense of a team of superheroes like Denley and Lahua, who you'll hear from in a minute, um, because we really need all the skills and knowledge possible on the team to ensure that our planet is a habitable place into the future. I love that. Thank you so much. Um, Denley, it sounds like the work that you're doing at National Geographic National Geographic Society, I've been having trouble with that, <laughs> um, is really uh, speaking to everything that Katie has just talked about, um, about broadening participation in ocean discovery. Can you tell me more about yourself, your background, and your efforts to innovate in ocean exploration and research? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me as part of today's panel. So I'm Denley Delaney, and I manage our, our portfolio of cutting edge tools and technologies within the Exploration Technology Lab and focusing on our marine portfolio. So the Exploration Technology Lab develops these tools and technologies to support and elevate the research of our community of explorers. And these technologies provide us with new perspectives of marine habitats and biodiversity, and also are helping us work toward creating a baseline for global deep ocean health. And so our efforts to innovate can really be exemplified through our deep sea camera system which we first developed in 2009 to collect video data from the Mariana Trench, so the deepest part of the ocean. And the camera essentially sinks to the sea floor where it collects environmental data in up to six hours of video data. And we have continued to innovate this tool over the years by making it smaller, more lightweight, and very importantly, lower cost. And so today's model weighs just 40 pounds and can be deployed by one person in a small vessel. So this is a great leap from alternative methods of deep ocean exploration, which as Katie mentioned just now, often requires large equipment and multiple personnel to operate tools such as ROVs and can also be extremely costly. So through our innovation, we're lowering cost barriers and logistical barriers to ocean exploration, which as Katie mentioned is so important when it comes to ensuring that the deep sea is accessible to as many communities around the world as possible. And lastly, our innovation has also allowed us to contribute to capacity development in the ocean exploration space. So we've made our deep sea camera systems easy to use. So we can train someone with no prior experience on how to operate the camera in just three days. So in addition to scientists, this has enabled us to train students on how to deploy the system, ensuring that there is knowledge exchange and capacity building within the next generation as well. Thank you so much for sharing about all of that. It's very exciting to hear about um, how technology is just expanding access and, and how people are working on this um, to make it a little more inclusive. Um, and speaking about that, Lehua, um, you, you've traveled the world in, on the ocean. <laughs> Um, and I've watched several documentaries about the Polynesian Voyaging Society, and I'm just amazed to be speaking with you right now. But for people who are unfamiliar with Polynesian Voyaging Society, can you give us a brief background on the organization and what it is that you do there? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Angela. And again, super honored to be around such cool people. I feel like a a child following some really amazing epic explorers around. <laughs> um, and in fact, the Polynesian Voyaging Society was created before I was even born back in 1973. And it has evolved tremendously in those over four decades now that it's been around. And initially it was part of a project to construct and navigate a traditional Polynesian voyaging canoe in the old way uh, without the use of instruments to Tahiti and returning back again. 
And that voyage, uh, which took place aboard the Hokulea, which is pretty well known nowadays, uh, it's a 62 foot uh, sailing canoe. And they completed that voyage successfully in 1976. So actually 45 years ago, yesterday they arrived in Tahiti and what happened in that voyage probably could have never been predicted or expected. It was a very interesting time where that particular canoe and the voyage and the work that was being done, particularly as it highlighted, I think, indigenous ingenuity and genius and innovation and accomplishment brought so much pride and just brought out I think a new vision amongst island people everywhere in Tahiti and in Hawaii about what the possibilities were, about the stories of where they came from and where they could go with it. And I think following up to both Katie and Denley around this idea that when we expand the conversation and expand who's included and who is empowered to be part of exploration and part of science and navigation, we really don't even know where that can take us. And so 45 years later, I am so fortunate to still be part of that work, to carry it on, uh, caring for our canoes that are the vessels of our exploration and our, you know, they say the space shuttle of our ancestors that we still get to sail today on these beautiful oceans. And um, so that's a little of the work we do. We did just recently complete a voyage all the way around the world uh, from 2014 to 2017. And naturally spend quite a, quite a bit of time on the deep sea, sometimes three to four weeks at a time and we get the opportunity to visit so many communities that touch the ocean, that interact with the ocean. And the theme of that voyage was called Mala Mahonua, meaning to care for the earth. And it was our way of both, I think, engaging in the conversation around sustainability and protection of our oceans and planet, understanding how other communities were addressing these issues and how we in Hawaii and with our canoes and in our work can also make sure we're doing our part to be responsible to that. Thank you so much. Um, and just to, to follow up a little bit, um, on your voyage from Hawaii to San Francisco in 2018, you said that the weather patterns you encountered were unexpected for that time of year. Um, how have things changed since you first started voyaging in 2009? Uh, thanks for asking that. And certainly, you know, as we are spending a lot of time in the ocean, we spend even more time on land, in fact, uh, studying weather patterns, studying the ocean conditions we're going to be going out into, and preparing ourselves to learn, and we have learned to expect the unexpected. <laughs> um, so much, I think, of navigation is understanding regular patterns, seasonal patterns, things that have taken place year after year for centuries, and relying on those patterns, whether they're of the ocean swells, of the wind, of the migratory patterns of birds or the daily fishing patterns. And so when these patterns are disrupted, you certainly notice them uh, because you're out there looking at nature 24 hours a day into the night, into the day. And we had actually planned our voyage uh, around prevailing wind conditions that we normally see in the summertime in the Northeast uh, Pacific. And we didn't quite get them and while it is one voyage over the course of three weeks, this was actually a pathway we'd never taken before to go to California. <laughs> and was the first time we attempted a navigation like that. And I certainly had questions afterwards about whether it was just me or <laughs> whether it was the weather. I'm sure part of it was just me. Um, but you start to pay attention to these changes when they are gonna affect whether or not this canoe reaches land successfully, whether or not it hits that island. Um, because those are the only signs you get out there or the signs of nature. And you start to pick up, you know, year after year, are the warmer seasons coming earlier? Are they lasting longer? Are the winds as strong? Are they lighter? Um, and those are the margins that make the difference in a successful navigation without instruments. It sounds like a very eventful first like lead navigator <laughs> trip for you. Um, congratulations That's though on achieving sure. that. Katie, can you speak to what the connection is between the ocean and climate change? Absolutely. So I'm going to go narrow it down a little bit from the entire ocean to the deep sea. Um, because so academic scientists are generally not 
funded or incentivized to solve problems for the entire community, but rather for very specific hypothesis-driven research. Why is this organism here? Why is this geological process happening um, in this place or over whatever period of time? Deep sea exploration is important because it's the first step in that scientific process. So I'm not interested in a single hypothesis. I'm interested in collecting baseline information across the deep sea about everything, everywhere, so that we can start generating those questions about this critical environment. And then we can begin to measure the changes that we've already been making to it. So the results and potential impacts of ODL's efforts will benefit a wide variety of ocean health issues, ranging from assessments of habitat changes due to fishing or deep sea mining, to impacts of climate change on the ocean, to the efficacy of marine protected areas for critical ocean regions. So we aren't aiming to solve one ocean issue or test one hypothesis, but rather to create a baseline data set a sensor ecosystem, and really a culture of community that supports a diversity of people around the world to pursue numerous marine conservation and sustainability issues. It seems pretty simple. Just a yeah. small guy. <laughs> Just all of them. <laughs> uh, awesome. So moving back to this, this conversation about um, expanding who is in the conversation and who is who has access to this data and the research and who has you know the who can be named an expert uh, in, in ocean sustainability and exploration um, I want to go back to you Lehua and and ask since you voyaged to and interacted with coastal communities around the world have you seen examples of those communities you know taking ex ocean exploration or climate action into their own hands? Absolutely. I think what was challenging for us to do as a voyaging canoe and understanding the way we voyage, which is to try and be led by our host communities, um, to be given permission to understand these stories from their lens before we ever leave, um, to interact, you know, first with first peoples of these places. Uh, so a lot of our work tends to involve a lot of cultural collaborations, a lot of uh, introductions and ceremony and understanding where people are coming from, both as a modern community, as well as some of the traditions that they have kept on or are revisiting as we try to design a more sustainable world for today, knowing that, you know, things are not exactly like they were 500 years ago, and certainly they are evolving constantly. And how do we bring together different sectors of the community? I think uh, our introduction to Katie throughout the worldwide voyage was certainly one of those things that was, we say, not by chance, because as we're able to bring more people into the conversation, to see one another's work and to see the power and the support that this gives each of us to work together, it's incredibly rewarding, motivating, inspiring to communities that I think could have felt very isolated in their work. and. When we went out with this idea of Mala Mahonua and caring for the earth, we really meant not to be prescriptive about it. You know, we're not here to tell you guys how to take care of your ocean or take care of your coastal community. We're trying to figure out ourselves how to do this. Um, we're in Hawaii and probably a topical issue right now is tourism. As we reopen uh, our own community, whether or not we are balancing the needs to take care of our coastal reef systems and the beauty that makes everyone so attracted to this place, with you know the economy that brings in visitors who get to experience it, enjoy it, and learn more about it. I remember when we actually stopped in Bali, uh, which has a very similar situation, a very vibrant, rich cultural history, but also challenges of the modern world and visitors. And in each port we went to, we might have been meeting with policymakers. We could have been meeting with schools and educational um, facilities that we're trying to get students thinking about the ocean in ways that the adults weren't yet, <laughs> or adults trying to bring in policies that would filter down into how communities were addressing these issues. Um, we are actually sister states with Bali, and we would set up conversations about where, how we're handling things like environmental degradation, waste management. We're just islands. Things have to go somewhere. How do we do it so that they don't end up in our oceans? 
Um, those were conversations that were very easy to understand once we found that common ground. Uh, right before that, we had actually sailed through Australia and, you know, the Great Barrier Reef, we all know, is one of the wonders of the world. Yet, it seems like uh, so much of that conversation is about, you know, you can see it from space and it's so beautiful and yet it is so incredibly fragile. And the work that happens is not just right there on the reef and diving the reef, but it happens at the schools and the students who become passionate about it, who learn about the organisms that are living there, who learn about the chemistry of the water and the reef guardian school system, which is designed to build these, these guardians of this reef that is their homeland. And that was really inspiring for us to understand how they were bringing in the youngest of children to caring about one of the biggest things on earth. So uh, the problem can seem large and, and so many of the answers have very simple, beautiful ways that come together to address them. Thank you. Um, Denley, you are a leader in, in environmental communication. And what role do you think that the media has in elevating these diverse voices and also, you know, bringing people into the work, kind of what Lehua was just mentioning? Absolutely. I think storytelling is a great way to provide perspective to audiences all around the world and to transport them to a place where they can see the ocean and see its richness and biodiversity and, and to really be able to um, get a greater awareness of its value and the importance in the role that it plays. Um, and I think empowerment and increased collaborations are a great, a great way for us to elevate the narrative um, of the work that a lot of these organizations are doing. I think the narrative, particularly of grassroots initiatives and community-led research and conservation projects can be elevated by organizations such as ours, National Geographic and others, really empowering them with the tools and skills needed to ensure that they have access to and ownership of um, the ongoing research in their marine environment. And this year, our team has been actively working to increase the network of explorers with whom we collaborate around the world. We'll be collaborating with multiple explorers from different regions with the goal of supporting their ongoing research. So we'll equip them with the deep sea cameras to increase their data collection capabilities. Um, we'll equip them with all the skills so that they can lead their own data collection process in the field and we'll provide them with um, assistance with scientific analysis. But through efforts like these where we're empowering the local scientists and the community to lead the research and where we simply provide the support I think through that is how we hope to be able to further elevate and focus the narrative on all of the great community-led um, research and conservation that's being done. Katie, what can we do to help? What's going on? As you know, Angela, we're very new. We don't even really have a website yet. So if you've gone there to try to look us up, not much. I make, made a LinkedIn last night. Um, so that means that we're going to need a lot of help getting up and running from organizational and administrative tasks to um, some of the more creative project specific ones. So one of our first projects relates to the data infrastructure engineer position, which thanks to Slack for Good is going to be funded this year. And we're so grateful for your support on this. Um, so recommendations for people who might be a great fit to help us get our Ocean AI project off the ground would be a huge help. Um, another project is the creation of a baseline assessment of the technical and human capacity for deep sea science and exploration in every coastal nation with deep water. So this is something that we just started sending out a couple of weeks ago. And the really the goal is that so that we know where we're starting in terms of what resources communities around the world have so that we know how we can develop and roll out our programs and projects over time. Um, so survey distribution as well as background research and analysis would be immensely helpful. Um, and not quite yet, but soon we'll also be working on tools, um, some of the more modular low cost robotic systems like those that Denley was talking about that National Geographic has, has developed for collecting deep sea data. So we'll need to work on, so actually I have one that my team's been working on for the last year. This is an underwater camera and it has nifty little connectors so you can connect different modules to each other. Um, 
So we'll be getting this one up and running probably later in the year and into 2022, and we'll need help with hardware, with software, user experience for the system to make it both low cost and easy to use. So removing those logistical barriers that Denley was talking about. That camera is so cool. Yeah, it's pretty clever. I'm oh, really I excited about this one. I just got my hands on it on Monday and I haven't gotten it in the water yet. And you mentioned it briefly, um, but can you speak to what Ocean AI is for the people who don't know? Yes, so that is a system that we have been um, working on a little bit, but we really will be launching um, through the Ocean Discovery League to address this issue of really vast amounts of underwater data. Now, take this with a grain of salt because I already said that we don't know that much, and yet there is a lot of data. There are a lot of data. Um, and there are from robotic vehicles, largely video, but also environmental data. And really the issue is that a lot of that sits on hard drives, on people's floors, in people's closets. They were seen maybe once, um, but there isn't a really integrated way to be able to um, access them, analyze them, and get a clear picture of the world's oceans. So we need to be able to use uh, machine learning to be able to analyze them in a meaningful way because when people do it it's extremely biased so you might have an expert volcanologist somebody who knows everything there is to know about underwater volcanoes but doesn't care about that fish swimming through it or doesn't care about that coral growing on it so the idea is how can we look at these data in a holistic way set that system up now before we start sending lots and lots of these out so that we can upload that data, analyze it, and start to get this more clear picture of the biogeography, you know, the distribution of biology and geology all over the world in the deep sea. So again, small projects. <laughs> uh, that's so great. Thank you so much for the expo uh, explanation, uh, for putting all of this together. Um, I, you know, you know, if you guys need me to be in Tahiti at any point, um, to just like help you launch the cameras or like wave at you on your voyage, let me know. I'll be there. Um, <laughs> the panelists, uh, I just want to thank you all so much for being here and sharing your passion and sharing your expertise with us. Um, it's clear that we have a lot more to learn from the ocean, but also that the work that you're doing is it's leading the way to important discoveries and also expanding the conversation. You know, um, we called this town hall changing the paradigm of ocean discovery. And I think that you've really proven that that's what we need in order to accelerate this process and to really learn and understand uh, the deep sea. Thank you so much.